Hello and welcome. This is Will Rams for Create the Learning Site, a place to go deeper in your understanding of the Bible. What new insights related to Christian Zionism have been produced by scholarship over the past 16 years? This is part two of a reevaluation of my doctoral dissertation of 2007. In part one, I looked at three points that I feel have been confirmed, and here I discuss new developments. Uh, as with part one, the fuller version with references and links is available on the website wilrens.org. New developments. I will discuss three of these, early activists, global Christianity, and the new prosperity gospel. So first, early activists. In my thesis, I had Christian Zionism begin, for the most part, only in the 1970s. And not without reason, Christians who wrote and spoke of Israel earlier remained strangely passive. They confined themselves to commentary and eschatological speculation. How did all this fit into the predictions of the biblical prophets and into the end time scenario? Apart from missionary outreach to Jews, there was rarely any active involvement. An important part of my thesis was an evaluation of the popular literature on the subject, based on about 400 books published in German on the topics of the end time and Israel. Three graphics. The first graph shows the development in the number of newly published books from 1945 down to 2004 in units of five years, divided according to the nationality of the author. And apart from a dent in the mid 80s, the number steadily rises. The second graph shows the development in the number of newly published books, also in units of five years, but now divided by topic and emphasis, distinguishing end time emphasis, EE and EI, and Israel emphasis, IE and II. Beginning around 1990, it shows a clear shift in emphasis to Israel. The third graph uses the same data, but shows the four categories as a percentage, making the pronounced shift in emphasis more visible. The formation of organizations shows a similar picture. With a few exceptions, organizations dedicated to supporting Israel did not emerge until around 1980. During the 50s and 60s, there were hardly any organizational, political or other initiatives among evangelicals that tried to actively support Israel. A turnaround did not begin until the 1970s. John Wolford, a leading American dispensationalist at the time, wrote in 1963, quote, I am not aware of any dispensationalists actively supporting the Zionist movement as a political movement. Why the turnaround? Why did it take so long for active support to develop? And what was the trigger? There are several factors, but most important were events in the Middle East, especially in 1967 and 1973. They were the most important trigger. For many, the Six Day War in 1967 was unequivocal proof that God was on Israel's side. A miracle. The Jews had survived 2000 years of exile and persecution, Adolf Hitler had tried to wipe them out, and against all odds, it was precisely after this attempt at extermination that the Jews succeeded in founding their state, like the phoenix rising from the ashes. Then, when a second holocaust loomed, this time at the hands of Arab aggressors, they crushed all their enemies in less than a week, taking possession of almost all the land God had promised Abraham, including Jerusalem. After this unexpected turnaround, the question was obvious. Was this salvation an act of God? To many evangelicals, the answer was equally obvious. Yes. Any skepticism about Zionism, because it was a secular, non-religious movement, was now put to rest. 
After 1967, a theoretical end-time expectation that had been developed by Puritans, Pietists and Dispensationalists, among others, became more and more associated with the phenomenon of the present. Reflections on a theoretical country of the future beyond the Second Coming increasingly gave way to interest in a state on this side of the end of the world. Different from the Israel in the Bible and the Israel of the future, this Israel could be touched. The dramatic events of those six days, plus their interpretation as a history of salvation, made this reassessment of Israel possible. Then came the Yom Kippur War of 1973 and made clear that God's miracle was not secure but threatened. In addition, there were the rise of the PLO, uh, the Palestinian terrorism of the 1970s, the threat of an oil embargo, the fact that the United Nations adopted a resolution equating Zionism with racism, the rise of anti-Zionism on the radical left, and the increasing criticism of Israel from the World Council of Churches and the media. At the same time, German foreign policy sought to move closer to the Arabs. Based on this list, one can understand the perception that, whether right or wrong, the whole world was standing against Israel and that Israel was being treated terribly unfairly by the world community. Under these circumstances, it was impossible for evangelicals to stand idly by, and so through Israel's success and Israel's peril, the Christian Zionist movement came into being. In the name of justice and because the completion of world history was at stake in the spiritual battle for Israel. So far so good. Others have since described a similar development due to events in the Middle East. But what I overlooked, or at least underestimated, are the Christian Zionists of the more distant past. And I now think one can certainly use this term in the 19th century in Great Britain and to a lesser extent in America. For example, the American William Blackstone. I was initially interested in the restoration of the Jews to the Holy Land and their conversion to Christ uh, as a step toward the Second Coming but he became increasingly concerned about the ferocious pogroms, persecution of Jews in Russia, instigated by the government in part. And he became convinced that it uh, was necessary to create a Jewish homeland in Israel. Uh, he visited Israel in 1888 and returned convinced that the return of the Jewish people to this ancient homeland was the only possible solution for the persecuted Jews. And so, in November of 1890, Blackstone organized the Conference on the Past, Present and Future of Israel in Chicago. Participants included leaders of both Jewish and Christian communities, uh, a, a very broad spectrum of uh, Christian and Jewish representatives. Part of the conference was a call that was issued urging the great powers, including the Ottoman Empire, Turkey, which controlled uh, this land uh, at the time, to return Israel to the Jews. And so uh, an essential trigger for William Blackstone's involvement was the pogroms in Russia. The conference decided to initiate a petition uh, which Blackstone implemented and published in 1891. It is known as the Blackstone Memorial uh, and it's a call for America to support the restoration of Israel. Wikipedia tells us that the memorial was signed by 413 prominent Christians and a few Jewish leaders in the United States. Blackstone personally gathered the signatures of people such as John D. Rockefeller, J.P. Morgan, senators, congressmen, religious leaders, newspaper editors, and others. Now, this is before Theodor Herzl published The Jewish State in 1896, uh, which 
a pamphlet which uh, sort of initiated the modern Zionist movement and eventually led to the State of Israel. And it was before the first Zionist Congress in 1897. Blackstone was a dispensationalist, but most of the signatories were not. And Blackstone's motivation was certainly not just his dispensationalist end time expectation. Later, in 1916, the memorial was put forward a second time at the insistence of American Jews, interestingly, but this time only in private, directly to President Wilson. 1916. It was instrumental in enabling the British to issue the Balfour Declaration a year later. The, Amer the American government was persuaded against the resistance, perhaps even in favour of quiet support. The British could have their declaration. The roots go further back. Robert Smith describes a petition by a couple, the Cartwrights, at the British Council of War in January 1649. They urged England and the Netherlands to bring Israelites to the Promised Land, which would bring God's blessing to the nation. Quote, that it presses this Judeo-centric tradition of restorationism into political service makes it the first example of Christian Zionism understood as political action informed by specifically Christian commitments to promote or preserve Jewish control of the geographic area now comprising Israel and Palestine. There is Anthony Ashley Cooper, the seventh Earl of Shaftesbury in the 19th century. He advocated that Great Britain should support a Jewish return to Palestine. In 1838, especially through his influence, a British consul was sent to Jerusalem for the first time, and in 1841, a Jerusalem <coughs> diocese, Anglican diocese, with a bishop was founded, initially together with Prussia and Germany. And then, soon after Herzl published his Zionist pamphlet in 1896, William Heschler, a German Englishman, was at his door. Heschler was a clergyman at the British Embassy in Vienna for many years, and he was convinced that the restoration of Israel was necessary and imminent. He was enthusiastic about Herzl's book, and Heschler had good connections. We opened the door for Herzl to several decision makers in Europe, including an audience with Emperor Wilhelm II in 1898. Well, nothing concrete came of it, but it did give Herzl and his Zionist project credibility. After all, he was seen in contact with makers and shakers of his time. One more example, Ord Wingate, this is 20th century, an officer in the British Army who arrived in Palestine, then a British mandate in 1936. And he allied himself with the Zionists against the uh, Arabs, uh, which had become increasingly uh, uh, violent in their opposition to Zionism. And from 1938, Wingate was in charge of the newly formed Special Night Squads, which consisted of British and Jews, uh, which included Yigal Alon and Moshe Dayan, later military commanders of Israel, and fought Arab saboteurs. It was a contribution to the formation of an effective army that was able to fight for Israel's independence in 1948. Shaftesbury, Blackstone, Heschler, or Wingate, there were only a few. But first, it's questionable whether the State of Israel could have come into being without their help and preparatory work. And secondly, in their home countries, they were backed by a broad basic swell of sympathy for the idea of Jewish restoration. Multitudes of British and Americans expected such a development and viewed it favourably. Balfour and the British government in 1917, Harry S. Truman in 1948, the president who pushed through US recognition of the State of Israel, they could assume that a significant part of their constituents would receive this step positively because the idea of restoring the Jews to Israel was so popular. In closing, on this point, 
When the opportunity arises or there is a need, the expectation of restoration can quickly become more. But not always, and by no means for everyone. That is why I still think the distinction between Restorationism and Christian Zionism is important. But the dividing line is unsharp and flexible, and one can certainly speak of Christian Zionism as early as the 19th century, albeit mainly limited to Great Britain. It was more important than I previously re recognized. Second point, global Christianity. In my doctoral thesis, I wrote that the movement is international, not just British American. But I didn't sufficiently realize the extent of the shift that is taking place. The vast majority of Christian Zionists now live in the Global South, and they are primarily neo-Pentecostal and not necessarily dispensationalist. In this context, Daniel Hummel speaks of the new Christian Zionism. A new type, it's charismatic, international and global, not primarily American. And as Hummel points out, this has consequences. Some non-Western countries, such as Brazil and Nigeria, will find it harder to be critical of Israel if large Christian minorities within their borders enthusiastically support Israel. The new face of Christian Zionism is perhaps most visible in the International Christian Embassy in Jerusalem. Founded in 1980, it has subsidiaries and representatives in over 90 countries. The Dutch played an important role in its foundation. For a long time, the embassy was led by Malcolm Hedding, a South African. Presently, Jürgen Bühler, a German, is president. And for more than 40 years, the embassy has been celebrating the Feast of Tabernacles in Jerusalem. <clears throat> uh, an anticipation of what is prophesied in Zechariah 14, verse 16. Then everyone who survives of all the nations that have come against Jerusalem shall go up year after year to worship the King, the Lord of Hosts, and to keep the Feast of Booths. Uh, several thousand participants from up to 100 nations take part. The highlight of the festival is a march through Jerusalem. And it shows very clearly that the new face of Christian Zionism is neither European nor American. It is international. So, early activists, global Christianity, now on to the third point. In my research, I noticed how often a certain Bible verse was repeated, almost mantra-like, in relevant publications. Genesis 12, verse 3. I will bless those who bless you. Interestingly, the entire promise in Genesis 12, verse 1 to 3, is addressed to Abraham as an individual. The personal, second-person pronouns, you, are in the singular throughout and refer to Abraham. But this is passed over in silence, not a word. The promise is directly applied to Israel and Jews today. The implicit interpretation, and it's always implicit, is... You refers to the people of Israel. Whoever blesses Israel will be blessed. Once in the Bible, this statement is indeed made with regard to Israel. In Numbers 24, verse 9, Billiam states something similar to Genesis 12, except that there it is said of Israel, quote, Blessed be he who blesses you, and cursed is he who curses you. You, in this verse, is also singular, but it clearly refers to Israel, unlike in Genesis 12. Numbers, however, does not play a role in Christian Zionism. It astonished me at the time, this consistent presenting of whoever blesses Israel will be blessed, as if it were a self-evident fact, although it actually misreads the text. Back then, I asked the question whether this might not create another gospel in which Israel, to a certain extent, takes the place of Jesus. A question also asked by Franz Stuhlhofer in a 1992 book. Who is God's messenger of blessing to the world? Is it Jesus? 
In the case of Vimalco, at least in places, it is Israel. Quote, Israel is God's mediator of blessing and salvation for this world. Our Christian Zionists will most likely reject the insinuation, another gospel, but whoever wants to be blessed, according to Christian Zionism, must bless Israel. Sufficient reason to pause and ponder. Here's another statement like this. Dirk Prince, quote, All of us who are not Jews owe every single important spiritual blessing we have ever inherited to a single people, the Jews. Okay, so far so good. Uh, that was in the thesis. However, what I had not seen is that in conjunction with ethno-nationalism, something new is emerging here, a new form of the prosperity gospel. And at this point, we can make sense of Michelle Bolsonaro, her t-shirt and her Instagram post. At this point, we can make sense of Michelle Bolsonaro, her t-shirt and her Instagram post that was at the beginning of part one. Christian Zionism is now more than just support for Israel. It's a kind of symbiosis between states and peoples. We support Israel, the blessing flows back to our country. A new identity is emerging that connects Jews and Israel and Christians. We are one. In doing so, the national is not abolished, it remains part of the new identity. Once more, I turn to Matthew Westbrook. He emphasizes that the national symbols of the Feast of Tabernacles and the Jerusalem March are not just colorful decorations. Quote, the expressions of national sentiment are not secondary to participation in the parade, but the very essence and its raison d'etre. The costumes of the participants, who also march together as national groups, are expressions designed not only to bless Jewish Israelis, but also to generate divine favor for their home nation. The participants feel the same way. By the way, when Westbrook was researching, Brazilians were the largest group at the festival, followed by Finland, Germany and Taiwan. The United States were only in fifth or sixth place. I will end with these conclusions. For many Christian Zionists, Israel is more important than end time theory. And even where eschatology remains important, the motivation for supporting Israel is usually more diverse. Eschatology is not the only factor and it's not always important. And if eschatology plays a role, then it is often a different one than that of doomsday scenarios. In other words, positions on the state of Israel are rooted in eschatological ideas, although often not of a dispensational variety, and large sections of Christian Zionism are now growing beyond these roots, partly by developing a much more dynamic end-time expectation. To state this differently, positions on the state of Israel are only in part the result of eschatological choices. And the influence also works in the opposite direction. Positions on the state of Israel are now leading to new eschatological choices.